Matthew chapter number 17. We'll begin with the context. So let's back up <clears throat> to verse number 13. We'll read the context in its entirety. The Bible says... <clears throat> When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say <clears throat> that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, <clears throat> Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he says this, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that's Jesus, he's referring back to when he said it, the fact that he is the Christ. And upon this, cro this rock <clears throat> I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So here in this passage, of course, we have Jesus asking his disciples. He, he uh, directly goes towards Peter with this question. He asks him, who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter, of course, gives him the answer, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responds to him and he says that, that he's right, that, that God revealed it to him in heaven, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And when he responds, he says, that's true, Peter. And upon this rock, talking about himself, not Peter, of course, I, it's outside of the scope, but I don't want to go in, so I don't want to go into that. But he says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then he goes on in the very next verse, and we're going to get more context of this just to show you this. Then he goes on in the very next verse, verse 19, he says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now that's talking about to the church. He's not individually speaking to Peter. We're, I'm going to show you a passage that actually proves that where this exact same statement is made to his apostles. And then I'm going to interpret it for you and actually what it means. So what takes place here is a conversation between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus ends up telling Peter at the end that he is going to build his church, number one. And then he says this, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So those are two points that we can walk away with from this passage. Number one, we can see that Christ has a church, right? We can see that. Now it's not the church of Christ, just because they're so called the church of Christ. The way that we determine who is the true church of Christ is who teaches and who holds to the doctrines that Christ taught to. And obviously, the so called church of Christ is way out in, it would be this side, the left field. They're way out in left field as far as teaching what Christ taught and, you know, even salvation, just the most basic of things. And that's what this is talking about. The key of the kingdom of God is talking about the gospel. I'll get into that further. So that's the first point is, number one, we see that Christ has a church and that he's the one that builds this church. Number two, it says this. So it's not just speaking of you know, general believers also. Keep that in mind. But he says this. The second point is this. He has a church. And it says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? He has a church. He gives to this church the keys of the kingdom of heaven, key, kingdom of God. And he says that the gates of hell will not prevail, prevail against it. Now, does this sound like it's a pretty strong institution? Does it sound like it's a pretty powerful institution? Does it sound like as Christians, it's something that we should be a part of? Amen. Doesn't it sound like it's somewhere where you're supposed to be? Right. Of course. Now I'm going to define with, for you uh, the word church in the Bible. Psalm chapter number 22, verse number 22. <clears throat> David says this, I will, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of of the congregation will I praise thee. So notice it says, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That's quoted in Hebrews 2.12 and it says this, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So what the word church actually means is congregation. It is specifically believers. Michaela, please give me a drink. Believers that are gathered together. The gathering or the assembling together of 
believers. So the couple of things that we learn one more time, because we're going to be springboarding off of this and I'm going to be referring back to this repeatedly. Number one, Jesus declares that he has a church. There is the church of Christ, the true church of Christ, not that denomination church of Christ. Number one, this church, he's the one that builds it. And, and it's referring to the fact that he's the rock he's built upon. The church is built upon the rock. And of course, Jesus is the word of God. Our church is founded upon, of course, faith in Christ himself, but also the word of God. That is our authority. Everything that we do here is based upon the word of God. And then number two, we can see that this church is given the keys of the kingdom. The key, they are given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And it says this, number three, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The title of the sermon this morning is The Benefits and the Necessity of Church. The Benefits and the Necessity of Church. There are many people out there who will attack the New Testament Church of God. And what they are attacking is this church that we are reading about right here. The church, the, the group or the assembly or the congregation that Christ instituted and put together and he says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What they are actually attacking is the church that Christ built and the church that is founded upon the rock of Christ. Now, there are a few different varieties of people that will you know, attack the church of God. Sometimes it's just unsaved people. You know, sometimes it's just God-hating people. Sometimes it's just people that just don't enjoy church. But oftentimes it is disgruntled Christians. Oftentimes it is people who maybe even, you know, maybe even they, don't, they have the right heart even. Sometimes it's disgruntled Christians with the wrong heart. Sometimes it's disgruntled, disgruntled or discouraged Christians that maybe have the right heart to some degree and maybe they had something very terrible happen at a church that they attended and they lost faithfulness in church. I'm going to just be showing you this morning all of the benefits of attending a local New Testament church. Not only that, I'm going to be showing you the necessity of attending a local New Testament church. Amen. First, I want you to go with me to uh, Psalm chapter number 22. We're going to be coming back to Matthew 16. We're going to be going to Psalm 22. So we're going to be looking here at <clears throat> all the different times in the Old Testament, the great joy that is mentioned and all of the praise that is given from the congregation while they are gathered together. Go to Psalm 22. The verse that I just read to you is where we're going to begin. Psalm chapter number 22. Look at verse number 22. He says this, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. I want you to notice what David says here. Of course, speaking uh, prophetically of Christ, but he says, he tells you where he's going to praise God and where is it? In the midst of the congregation. He says, you know what I'm going to praise God? I'm going to praise him among my brethren. I'm going to praise him in the church. Look down at verse number 25. It says this, my praise shall be of thee in the a great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Notice how he's specifically referring to the fact that he wants to be around the people of God when he's doing these things. He says, I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Because he's why? He's gathered together with the brethren. He's gathered together amongst the saints. He's gathered together in the congregation. I want you to go now to Psalm chapter number 35. This is a theme throughout the book of Psalms. Just the book of Psalms alone teaches you the importance of going to church. Look at Psalm chapter number 35. Look at verse number 18. It says this, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. And then he says, I will praise thee among much people. Notice that. This is David saying, you know what I'm going to do it? I'm going to do it among much people. Hey, it's good to praise God when you're by yourself, but guess what? You also need to praise God among, among much people. You also need to praise God in the great congregation when the brethren, amongst those that fear his name, like David said, when the brethren and the saints are gathered together. This also, notice David wants to specifically say, I also do it here. I do it amongst the brethren. Go now to Psalm chapter number 89, verse number 5. Psalm chapter number 89, verse number 5. You'll see this is mentioned repeatedly. <clears throat> A major time to praise God is in the congregation. Amen. Psalm chapter number 89, verse number 5, it says this. <coughs> and the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. 
Now flip over to in the book of Psalms again. Go to Psalm chapter number 107, verse number 32. <clears throat> so the congregation there, the congregation of the saints is praising his wonders. Look at Psalm 107, verse number 32. Psalm 107, verse number 32. <clears throat> Psalm 107, verse number 32, it says this, Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. That's also another word for church or congregation. It's assembly. Notice it says the assembly of the elders. And specifically here, two things are mentioned, that they are going to exalt him also in the congregation of the people. Hey, Exalt him while you're at home. But guess what? Also, you need to exalt him in the congregation of the people. Not only that, it says, praise him in the assembly of the elders. Look at Psalm chapter number 111, verse number 1. Psalm chapter number 111, verse number 1. <clears throat> this is not a suggestion. I want you to read what's, what, what's, what's being said here. Psalm chapter number 111, verse number 1, it says this. Praise ye the Lord. Do you think that's a suggestion? Do you think he's just giving you good advice? No. Praise ye the Lord. And then he says this. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. I want you to look at Psalm chapter number 149, verse number 1. Psalm chapter number 149, verse number 1. Over and over again, where are you supposed to praise God? In the congregation, in the assembly. People have all kinds of cockeyed ideas of where, you know, I can just go out into the field. I can just go out into the, amongst nature with the trees. I can just, you know, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. That is not a congregation. Hey, yeah, you gather together with other brethren, you know, the fellowship can be sweet. There can be great unity. I enjoy talking with two or three people about the Bible. But guess what? I want to go to the great congregation like David mentioned. I want to go to the assembly of those that fear God. I want to gather together with the saints and with the assembly of the elders and serve God and praise God and exalt His name there as well. Hey, praise God in the open field if you want to. Go out into the trees, you know, and, and do whatever you want to do out there and, and read the Bible, whatever. But you know what else you need to do? You need to go to the assembly of the elders. You need to go to the great congregation. You need to go and gather together with saints and brethren that fear his name and praise God there as well. That's what you need to do. Look here in Psalm chapter number 149, verse number 1. It says this, Praise ye the Lord. Again, this is not a suggestion. This is not a recommendation. He's telling you, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise. Look at this. In the congregation of saints. This is not a suggestion what you're seeing repeatedly. This is not just good advice. David is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he is telling you, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And do you know specifically where he says you should be praising God? In the congregation of the saints. We see this repeatedly. Over and over again you'll see praising God with a new song, singing, right? Well this is also mentioned in the New Testament. We may, we may look at this verse one other time also <clears throat> later in the sermon, but first right now I want you to turn to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3. This is going to tie in with what we had uh, begun to speak of there in Matthew 16. So I'm going to, I'm going to be going back to that point in just a few minutes. <clears throat> but look here in Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 16. <coughs> look at verse 15 first. <coughs> and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. Now what is the body in the New Testament? What is the body specifically referring to? The body of Christ is the church of Christ, right? So notice what he's talking about. The church, the congregation, the assembly, the gathering together of saints, all of them that fear his name, the brethren coming together. What is it? It's the assembly of elders. This is an organized institution, right? In the New Testament, we can very clearly see that there are rulers that are ordained with certain qualifications over the church. They are rulers over the church. It's the assembly of the elders. This is not just like some free-for-all. It is an organized institution. That's what we see in the church. Here in Colossians 3.15 there, we see the church being spoken of. We see the church being alluded to. Now look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And then it says teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. 
to the Lord. So we see the exact same truth that we saw many times in the book of Psalms where David, when he's speaking of praising God, he's talking about praising Him through song. Paul is writing specifically to the church, to the assembly, the body of believers, and he tells them this is not an option. This is not just a recommendation. He says in verse number 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's a commandment. That's a commandment to a Christian. You need to be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Here it actually says, teaching and admonishing one another. I was quoting Ephesians 5, the parallel to this. Here it says, teaching and admonishing one another. That's one of the great benefits of coming to church, is that when everyone's singing, when all the children are singing, you're admonishing one another, you're teaching one another, you're edifying one another. That's the purpose of bringing everyone together. Amen is so that we can edify and build each other up. That's what the word edify means, to build one another up. Notice that this is a New Testament teaching as well, that you are supposed to be singing and praising God in, as a whole, as an assembly, gathered together as a body, one another. This is springboarding into what I wanted to speak of in Matthew chapter number 16. Singing and things along those lines, go back to Matthew chapter number 16. That is a ministry. In the Old Testament... Uh, God himself, through David, he ordained the ministers of song. He, spoke, he chose out and handpicked specific uh, um, uh, families of the tribe of Levi to be ministers in the temple. That is a ministry. That's a ministry of the operation of God. That is a ministry of the church. Amen. And I'm going to show you this morning that all of the ministries, which is the works of God, all of the ministries come from and are given to the church of God. That's one of the main things I want to focus on and I want you to take away from this sermon this morning. If you want to do works for God, if you want to do ministries for God, these ministries have been given to the church of God. Just like they were in the Old Testament, all the ministries were given to the church of God. That's where the works were given. That's where people are sent out to do those types of works. Amen. Here in Matthew chapter number 16, of course, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What if I were to ask you, what is the key to get to heaven? What is it? It's faith, right? But what, what, is, the, what is the message? It's the gospel, right? It's, that's what the gospel is. Here in Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 19, that's what we see him speaking of. He says this, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's, that's the key to get into heaven. And what is it? It's the gospel. What did he give and send his disciples forth with? The gospel. That's what he gave them. We look at specifically who it was given to, I said disciples, but what does he say in verse 18 in this context? It says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he says, and I will give unto thee, in the context of the church, members of the church, speaking of leaders at the church, the disciples who are meant to be sent forth and plant the church, the church is, he says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You flip over to Matthew 18, verse 18, it says this. You can see now it's, that was actually speaking in singularity. Now we see it being spoken of in plurality where he's talking to all of his disciples. He says this. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Notice the plurality now. Why? Look at verse 17. And if ye shall neglect to hear, thee, to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as, a, and as a publican. Who's he talking to again? The church. Where are these keys given? This key. What is it? It's given to the church. What is the key? It's, it's the gospel. That is how you are, you know, that, that is how you are saved. That's how you get into heaven. That is the key to get into heaven. It's the gospel. And what did he send his disciples forth with? He told them in John chapter number 21, he breathed on them with the Holy Spirit when he sent them forth to preach the gospel. And he said, whatsoever, uh, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. What do they have? The key of the kingdom of heaven. And what are they going to do? To preach the gospel. The ministry of preaching the gospel is given to the local New Testament church. He says specifically two different times that, hey, I have a key in the context of the church, and I'm giving it to you. 
The job of getting the gospel to the world is given to the local New Testament church. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. <clears throat> when Jesus sent forth his disciples to go into the world to preach the gospel, and of course there were hiccups, some of them didn't go, some of them did. Paul the Apostle mainly. What did he end up doing? What did Paul end up doing? Exactly. He went into a city, he preached the gospel, he started a church. And then you know what he did? They went out and he sent them out to teaching them how to go forth and preach the gospel. Every time. You read in the New Testament, do you know who's preaching the gospel? People that attend a local New Testament church always. Always. Every time. The ministries were given to the local New Testament church. The, the gospel, the, the message of the gospel. Hey, if you go out and preach the gospel just on your own as a Rambo... Hey, praise God that people are getting saved. I'm so happy that people are getting saved, but that's not how Christ intended that to be. He says that he gave the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the local New Testament church. That's what he wanted, was he wanted the church to be the ones that were heading up the ministry or the work of preaching the gospel to the world. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 18. It says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their, their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now what's the ministry of reconciliation? Of course he's talking about preaching the gospel, right? Verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. Who's Paul talking to? The local New Testament church is who Paul is talking to. Who has the... I mean, it's just as simple as Matthew chapter number uh, uh, 16, verse 17, 18, and 19. Who has the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Who did he say specifically he was giving the keys of the kingdom of heaven to? The church. The church. I want you to think about this as well in tandem with that. We see the, the, those that are doing the ministry every time an apostle or, or a disciple is sent out to preach the gospel. Do you know what they do immediately? They preach the gospel to people. They start a church and then that church starts preaching the gospel every single time. You know why? The keys are handed to that church then. Now they're saved. Now they're given the ministry of reconciliation. Who's he writing to right now? He's writing to a local New Testament church. Not only that. The, the, the Word of God, even in general, how valuable and how, how you know, special is the Word of God? How precious is the Word of God? You look in the New Testament, you look throughout the books of the New Testament, virtually every single book, do you know who they're written to? Churches. Do you know who God, when He inspired the Holy Spirit to write down, the, you know, a man with the Holy Spirit to write down these words and to send forth the, the Scriptures, do you know He wanted to have it? He just send it to individuals. Do you know where he wanted to have it? Do you know where it circulated? Amongst the churches. So if you attended a local New Testament church at that time, do you know what you had your hands on? The scriptures and the word of God. Do you know if you just wanted to not go to church and not assemble yourselves together with brethren? Do you know what you didn't have? The word of God. You didn't have the scriptures. That's why God chose specifically when he wanted to give his word, he wanted to give the scriptures to someone. What did he do? He had it inspired. Paul would write and then he would send it to the churches. You look in the book of Revelation. God write, has the scriptures written. Jesus wants to address someone. He doesn't just address individuals who are saved, living somewhere. Who does he write to? He writes to his local New Testament church. That's who he writes to. Repeatedly all throughout the New Testament we can see this. Even when individuals are mentioned, God, when, when, when uh, there may be a, a, a letter that's written to an individual, almost all the time they'll mention the fact that they, hey, you know, uh, greet the church that is in your house. These people are, are attending a church and they'll read these letters to the church. <clears throat> I want you to go to uh, Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25. So Christ is the one himself that founded the church. He founded the church. Doesn't that sound like something you ought to be a part of? Yeah. Something you ought to not neglect? If he says, hey, I'm going to build this church. Don't you think you should try to be a part of that church? Yeah. If Christ himself, if God built it. Not only that, if, it's a, if, if this church, this institution has the keys of the kingdom of heaven, don't you think you ought to be there? Yeah. Don't you think that's something that you ought to take part in? 
If they're the ones that are given this ability to go out and to preach the gospel, and when he gives such a powerful statement, hey, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Doesn't that sound like somewhere where you should be? Amen. Where it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I had you turn, are you there? Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25. <clears throat> so we see Christ founded his church. But not only that, the Bible tells us that Christ loves the church. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25. It says this, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So this is what we have so far. Number one, we are commanded to sing praises in the congregation. Number two, Christ himself founded the local New Testament church. Number three, Christ gave the church the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's the gospel, of course. Christ gave the churches the scriptures. In the New Testament, when we look, we see that Christ gave the churches. That's who received the scriptures. The churches. And then we see, not only that, it says that Christ loves the institution of the church. Doesn't that sound like something you should love? If Christ loves the church, don't you think you should love that? Don't you think you should love the things that Christ loves? As we saw a little bit already, Christ gave the ministries to the local church. We see that with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This is further going to be proved while you're here in Ephesians 5. Go over to Ephesians chapter number 4. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter number 4. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 7. Ephesians chapter number 4, look at verse number 7. <coughs> it says this, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So we're given grace and we're given a gift is what he's referring to. He's going to go through some of these different gifts in just a moment. Look at verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up, he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So at his resurrection, one of the things it says that took place, this is of course through the Holy Spirit. He gave gifts unto men, right? Because it says, you know, Christ was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit was not yet given and Christ was not yet glorified. Through the Holy Spirit, we, the Bible talks about that uh, we can receive spiritual gifts. It's the one spirit working in one body, right? And it talks about the gifts in 1 Corinthians. That's what this is talking about. Through his resurrection, and he gave the Holy Spirit to, of course, members of the church. The one body. Look here at verse number 11. It talks specifically about those gifts. Look at the different gifts that are given. <clears throat> so this is, of course, significant. This happened at his resurrection, or after, if you will. Verse 10, or verse 11. And he gave some apostles. So these are some of the gifts. And some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So th these are some of the gifts that are given, right? Look at verse, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. So he gave this for the perfecting so that a saint can be complete, right? So that all the saints would be able to be complete. Now, now, what specifically were these gifts? What were they? Look one more time. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, right? Look at verse 12 again. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So what's the purpose of an apostle? To edify the body of, the, of Christ. The body of Christ. What's the body of Christ? It's the local New Testament church. I'm not going to turn to a verse to show you that. I know that most people are familiar with that, right? What's the purpose of prophets? What's the whole reason why he gave these people gifts? To be a prophet, to be a preacher. What's the reason? To build up the local New Testament church. Amen. It's all about the local New Testament church. To build the church up. Okay? What about the evangelist? What's the point of an evangelist? An evangelist is a soul winner. To build up the church. Amen. For the church. It's all about the church. Again, look at the pastors and teachers. What's the reason for the gifts? For the church. Then it says this, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. So for, for the perfecting of the, so the saints can be complete. So the saints can have everything that they want. If you want to be a complete Christian, do you know where you need to go? 
to church. Do you know where the apostles and the preachers and the teachers and all of those types of people, of course no apostles are, are, there, are here today, but everybody else on that list, do you know where you're going to find those people? In a local New Testament church. So if you want to be a complete Christian, that tells me, do you know where you need to be? At the body of Christ. You need to be in the local New Testament church if you want to be a complete Christian. If you want to be, if you want to be a Christian that, that is growing, that is progressing in their life, you have to go to church. You have to be in church. That's the whole reason why. Don't think that you know better than Jesus. Why would Jesus have given them for the perfecting of the saints if you think you can be perfected some other route, some other way? He would have been wasting his time. The way to be perfect, the way to be a complete Christian is through the local New Testament church. That's what Jesus says. That's what the Bible says. Not only that, it says this, for the work of the ministry. All of those gifts that are given are for what? The work of the ministry. Where is it taking place? The body of Christ. What is ministry? It's work. The work of the ministry. Do you know where the ministries and all of the work takes place? The body of Christ. All of the ministries were given to the church of God. All of the works take place from the church of God. All of them. That's the whole purpose. The keys of the kingdom of heaven were given to the church. The gospel, the job. Hey, here's, that's what he's talking about. The job of preaching the gospel to the whole world. I'm leaving. Here's the keys. Now you guys go do it. Now here's your job. Now you go preach the gospel to the world. You know what they do? It's given to the church, he said. So when they found they get another person saved, hey, here's the ministry of reconciliation. He hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. All of those that are reconciled, right? And it's given to the local New Testament church. That's the job. Hey, like I said... I'm, I'm thankful that for anyone who gets saved, of course, Amen. anybody who gets saved, if you're a Rambo out there just soul winning and you don't have a local New Testament church, I'm happy that people got saved. But God, here's the thing. You better understand God and Christ did not intend for you to do, that, do it that way. That was not his intentions. His intentions were for all of those gifts to be funneled through the church. His intentions were that he wanted to give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the church and then for a person to be sent out from the local New Testament church. They're always sent out two by two every time anyone goes soul winning. How are you going to do that? Well, you come to a local New Testament church. All of the gifts here are what? They're for the church, the body of Christ. Well, look at verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, <coughs> excuse me, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's why these things were given to the church. To help you to grow up so you, could, so you can grow up under the fullness and the stature of Christ. So you could grow up and you could learn and know the knowledge of the Son of God. It says, till we all come, look what it says, to the unity of the faith. Notice the plurality of what Paul's talking about. Because you coming to church is not just for you. And when people always start talking about like, ah, oh, the church doesn't help me, the church doesn't do this, it's not just about you, my friend. Right. Maybe you need to go there and maybe you need to help somebody else come into the unity of faith. Amen. Maybe you're one of the people with the gifts. Right. Maybe you need to go to the church so that you can help perfect the body of Christ. Maybe you need to go there so that you can help other Christians prog progress. Right. Oftentimes, though, let me give you a caveat as well. Oftentimes, when you're the one thinking, hey, I know the Bible so much better. I'm saying those pastors don't know hardly Jack or anything like that. Oftentimes, you don't know the Bible near as well as you think you know the Bible. I, you know, even when I was reading my Bible constantly and I was still even getting ready to be sent out from my own pastor, we had a fundamental disagreement when it comes to interpreting the Bible. He was, a, he was a, you know, an extreme dispensationalist, but I learned things from him every single sermon. He knew the Bible extremely well, and I constantly was learning things from him all the time. And if these people who are talking bad mouthing to all the churches in their area and they can't find a church anywhere, if they were to shut up and go to church and actually have the right attitude about the local New Testament church and understand the power that was given unto it and what Christ thinks about it and how he loves it, and there's commandments to be there. And they had that attitude and they sat down in the pew or they sat down in the chairs and they listened to the preacher and the pastor. They would learn a lot, I guarantee. You know what they would do is they'd find out how little they know and how much their pastor actually knows. That's what would happen. So all of these people that have this attitude, hey, even if you are the person and you do know way more than all these other you know, pastors out there, which I don't buy that for a second, even if that was true, why don't you go there, you selfish jerk, so that you can bring all these other people to the unity of the faith? 
It's not only about your spiritual growth, it's about theirs too. It's not only all about you. Life is not all only all about you. Maybe they need you to go there and light a fire under them. Maybe nobody's going soul winning and you could start a new soul winning ministry there. Maybe instead of you just going out on your own and preaching the gospel door to door, maybe you can go there and the whole church will go start going soul winning because of you. It's selfishness is what it is. Amen. It's for the brethren to gather together so that each person can help build one another up. Amen. And you know what? If you don't go to church, you're a lacking Christian. You can tell me all stinking day, I'm a, I'm a full-grown Christian. No, you're not. You're a lacking Christian. You're half a man. You know how it talks about here? It says that we might unto a perfect man. You know what that means? Complete man. You're half a man. If you don't go to church... The whole, the whole purpose of the church is to make you a perfect man. You can't be a, a complete man without it. You're half a man, buddy. You're not a full man. You're half a man. Because you don't have the church and it's there to perfect you. If you don't have it, you're half a man. You can tell me. I don't care. The Bible says you're half a man. You need the church to be a complete man. You don't go to church, you're half a man. Period. You, and you'll never be a complete man. You'll, God will never look at you and say, hey, that's a perfect man. That's a complete man until you go to church, my friend. Amen. Go to church if you want to be a complete man. Go to church if you want to be a perfect man. And all the time when you see the people that are falling out of church or can't find a good church in their area, they're always tossed to and fro. Look at what it says in the next verse. Always. Verse 14. <coughs> that. So you know what that means? It's saying that the church was given so that this wouldn't happen. Keep that in mind. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Do you know what you <coughs> will be if you don't go to church? You'll be half a man. You'll be a child who's tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's what you'll be if you don't have a church that you go to. When you see people that don't attend a church all the time, they have a new doctrine every time you talk to them. They're changing their doctrine on everything constantly. You know why? It's because they don't know the Bible like they think they know the Bible. And they're, they have this puffed up attitude. Like, hey, I'm, I'm better than all my pastors. I know more than all these other churches that I went to. All these pastors that I had attended their church. I know the Bible so much more than them. I'm so much more knowledgeable than they are. But they don't truly and, 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 and genuinely know the Bible better than those pastors. They're puffed up. And people like that, they don't realize how childish they really are in their ways. And what they're doing is they're just changing their doctrine constantly. They're changing their doctrine all the time. The Bible says that that's like a child. Kind of like half a man. Like they're not fully a man yet. It's like a child. They're weak. They're being pushed to and fro. People are, are deceiving them constantly. Because you know what they're doing is, instead of going to a local New Testament church where they have a ruler who's sound in the faith and is sound on his doctrine, and he's not going back and forth all the time, he actually knows what he believes. Do you know what they're doing? They're watching YouTube videos from all these different people. And you know what's happening? They're being deceived by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. They're getting on YouTube and they're watching all these videos. Or they're just watching, you know, on the television all these different preachers. Going to all these different preachers. They don't have a, a real local New Testament church that they go to. They don't have a real pastor, ruler, or teachers, or anything that they're going to to learn the Bible. That's what's happening to these types of people. Notice the, 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 <coughs> the emphasis on... Everyone being together in order for this to take place. Look at the next verse, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So the head of what? The body, right? Talking about the church can grow up into the head. Saying that without this body being gathered together, you will never be able to be the full man it, growing into the measure and the stature of Christ. The height of Christ is what it's referring to, right? The body, if you just eliminate the head, and the head is Christ, the body obviously itself alone is not as tall as the head, with the head itself, right? Well, Christ is the head of what? The church. So without the body, you will never be able to be the full man, the stature of the, of the height of Christ. Who is the perfect man? It's talking about Christ. That's what it tells you there actually in verse number... The stat, in verse number 13, the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, again, <clears throat> 15, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head. 
right? And then it says, even Christ. Look at verse 16. From whom the whole body, now watch this carefully, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted, so it's fitly and it's joined together, all the components are, are connected with one another, referring to unity within the body. And compacted by that which every joint supplieth. So there's different gifts that each part of the body has. And each joint is supplying something different. They all have a different you know, a, a benefit for each other. That's why you can't... So a, another person has a, a, another benefit for this church that someone else doesn't have. And the person that doesn't have that, they need what that other joint supplies. And without being around that other person... Because that, that's a spiritual gift is what this is referring to. Without being around that other person that has that, that, that benefit or what that other joint supplies, like this refers to it as, they're never going to be able to grow. They're not going to be able to receive that nutrition that they need, that spiritual nutrition. Look at what it says next. <clears throat> it says, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. So notice that there's an effectual working. There is a powerful working, if you will. There's effect from each part. There's something that each person brings to the table when everyone gathers together. All these different gifts is what that's referring to. It says this, Maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All of the gifts of people that can preach the gospel, the you know, pastors, teachers, all of these different things, evangelists, that's referring to a soul winner, all of these gifts, do you know where they're intended to be? The church, Amen. every one of them. He it says that he, when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. Do you know why he gave gifts unto those men? So that they would be able to edify the body of Christ. The whole reason is so that you can all gather together, all in one place, assemble together, and congregate, and you can all help one another. That is Christ's purpose. Amen. That is the purpose of Christ. This is what we walk away with so far. Christ has a church. He founded a church, and it's built upon the rock, which is Him, right? He founded a church. So there's the church of Christ, right? We know that. And, it's, and it says that that church, that the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. It's a powerful church, right? But not only that, further, it says that unto them was give, given the, the gifts of, or I'm sorry, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the ministries, right? The work of preaching the gospel. Here, what do we see? Perfect congruency with this. What do we see? We see that the, all of the gifts, everything that was given to all men that are saved men, saved born believers, born again believers, what do they have? <coughs> gifts that were given to them specifically to bring to the body of Christ. If you have a gift and you're sitting at home and you obviously if you're sitting at home and you think you're so great, you think you're like this special Christian that everybody else needs, you know, <clears throat> that's the attitude that people have. Why would you be sitting at home in the first place? If you do have a gift, it's there for the body of Christ. Amen. It was given to you so that you could edify other people. Right. Psalm chapter number 122. Verse number one says this. You should love coming to church. Let me say that first before I read these couple of verses. You should love coming to church and gathering together. Amen. Psalm 122 verse one says this. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. David um, was a man after God's own heart. The majority of the Psalms were written by David. And David is constantly talking about praising God, going to church, how he loves being in church. Psalm chapter number 84 verse 10 says this. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So he's not only making the contrast there, well, he, that he'd rather be, you know, a doorkeeper, some sort of um, derogatory task or something that's without reputation. He's not only making a, a, con a, a contrast to say, hey, it'd be better to just even be a doorkeeper than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. That's not true because he starts it off by saying, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. You know what he's saying? If you, were, if you were able to dwell in the house of God one day and compare that to a thousand other days, that one day in the house of God is better than all those other days. That's the, that's the attitude of a Christian. If you don't feel like the author did of Psalm 122 verse 1, there's something wrong with your heart, my friend. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. There's something wrong with your heart if you don't feel that way. 
Acts 2.41, we'll see this in the New Testament. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 <coughs> souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And you say, well, that's not, that's not the, the local New Testament church. Oh, really? What were the apostles for? The body of Christ. And what did it say? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So you know what's going on? This is the local New Testament church gathering together and the apostles are teaching and preaching to them. This is the assembly. The whole reason that he gave the gifts of the apostles was for what? The edifying of the saints, the body of Christ. Right? <clears throat> Notice that they were joyfully gathering together. Right? It says they continued steadfastly. Acts 20, <coughs> chapter 20, verse 7 says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. That's church, gathering together the first day of the week, Sunday. Look at 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, I'll read you also from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. It says this, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. You know what that tells me? At the very least, they were meeting one time a week. At the very least, they were coming on the first day of the week. Now, that I believe they were meeting more often than that by just reading the, 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 uh, the book of Acts. It talks about them meeting multiple times in, in, in a week. I didn't include those in this because I wanted to make a specific point from 1 Corinthians 16.2 here. That's not even what I was focusing on. My point was this. Notice it says that, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So what's he telling them? It was to an offering. He's talking about giving an offering, right? Here's the thing. You may, I'm sure if you don't agree with going to church, you don't believe in tithing, that's fine. But you would at least have to acknowledge that there's giving. There's givings, right? You have to give in the New Testament. Anybody who says, hey, you don't have to tithe, they'd say, well, you're supposed to give at least. It's not of necessity, but you should give, right? That's what people would say. That's most most people at least would say. Where are you giving it? Where are you Where are you giving this to? Where are you bringing your givings? Because you don't believe it's tithing. Where are you giving? Paul told them where to do it when you're gathered together on the first day of the week. Not only that, how do you take the Lord's Supper? I can prove to you as clear as day that the Lord's Supper takes place at the church from 1 Corinthians. It takes place when they are gathered together. When they come together. How are you taking the Lord's Supper? That's a commandment. This do ye in remembrance of me. That's a commandment. How are you taking the Lord's Supper? Christ wants you to go soul winning. That's through the church. The evangelist, the gifts of, of being an evangelist, preaching the gospel, that comes from the church. All of the gifts that are given, they're given to the body of Christ. They're given to the church. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. <clears throat> I can guarantee you, I can, and I don't care who it is, whether their heart is right to a degree or whether it's not, but I can guarantee you anyone who does not go to church or is who is arguing against people talking about the necessity of going to church, they're a selfish person. I can guarantee you that. Because every time the church is talking about, talked about, it's not talking about specifically and admonishing you to go for your own benefit. It's always talking about for everyone's. To think about everyone, like we saw in Ephesians just a moment ago, Ephesians 4. Look again here at Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, <clears throat> and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Of course, the assembly there, assembling of ourselves together, is talking about church, gathering together for church. You look at the verse before, what's one of the things for, for the reasons of gathering together and assembling together? And let us consider one another. That means to think about each other. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You know what, why we come to church? One of the reasons is because we provoke one another. We can encourage. That's what that means. To encourage or provoke one another to love 
and to good works. You need that. Amen. You need other people to provoke you from time to time. Amen. You're not this perfect man all on your own. You're not just this complete man that just has everything figured out. I have all of the mysteries of the Bible figured out. I know more than everyone else. No one has gifts that can benefit me. That's not you, my friend. You need to be provoked. Amen. Even yourself, if you think about it from your perspective. Amen. But you know what else you need to do? You need to come so that you can provoke other people. That's why you need the church. To provoke others unto love and to good works. I guarantee you all these people that don't go to church, I guarantee they don't go soul winning on a weekly basis. Guar I guarantee you. I, I am very confident about that. You want to find me one in a million? Okay. The exception proves the rule. But guess what? You know, all the other thousands upon thousands who want to run their mouth about the church, who's doing ten times the amount of work that they're doing, and they want to just run their mouth about all the, uh, you know, the local New Testament church, they just want the money, and they just want it. You're just lazy. You're just worried about yourself. That's all that it is. They have time for all their own menial tasks. They have time for all their own hobbies. They have time for all these other things that they do for themselves. You know what they are? They're just concerned about themselves. That's the whole reason. That's it. Church service takes place for like an hour and a half. What are you doing Sunday morning? What in the world are you doing? Are you seriously going to tell me that you would be better off staying at home than going to a local New Testament church? I don't care what church it is. I don't care what, if, as long as it is a Baptist, King James only, independent Baptist church, where there are saved believers there, I don't care what they're doing. It would still be better for you to go. Amen. It would still be best for you to go. It's such a ridiculous, it's, a self, it's such a selfish concept. Why are they not going to church in the first place? Because they're selfish. That's why. Because they have other things they want to do. It's be also because tying in with being selfish, they think so highly of themselves. All these churches are so bad. So, yeah, these problems, all these problems. You're not that great, I'm sure. I guarantee they don't read their Bible on a regular schedule even. Not, let alone every day. I guarantee they don't. You know why? Because they don't have people to provoke them unto good works. They're not as strong of a man as they think they are. They're not near, you know, they're half a man because they don't have the other jointly fit, to, the other joints that supply every need, that they, the things that they need, that they think that they have all of it. But then there's this, these other joints over here that actually have what they need. There's the pastors that have what they need. There's the teachers. There's all the other people with all the other gifts in the church that have what they need. But they think they're they're a full man. They think that they have everything. Not without the body of Christ. Not without the local New Testament church. This is a commandment in verse 25. To say that this is not a commandment, I, you know, as plain as possibly can be, you're an idiot. Verse, look at this, verse 23, one more time. <clears throat> Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Do you think that's a suggestion? Do you think he's commanding you to do this? Because this is what you should do. Okay? Look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So you think that it's just a suggestion that we should not forsake ourselves, not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. It's just a suggestion just to exhort one another. That is complete stupidity. That is complete. And this book is not just a book of suggestions. Right. This is not just a book of good advice. Mm -hmm. This is God's Word telling you what to do. Amen. And this is a commandment. Right. To gather together, Amen. not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's a commandment, my friend. And this is not just talking about two or three people gathering together. Do you know how you know that? Well, number one, an assembly is not just two or three people gathering together. But number two, at the end of this book, in Hebrews chapter number 13, do you know what he tells them? Obey them that have the rule over you. Do you know who that is? Pastors. Right. Do you know who he's writing to? This is not just random individuals of, of, of people just, you know, whoever you can get this, this letter to, brother. You know, just pass it around all the believers. 
and all their houses. That's not the purpose of this. Obey them that have the rule over, your, over you. And then right here it says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Do you know what he's writing to? He's writing to the church and he's telling the church, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. Amen. But exhorting one another. And so much the more. It's the same exact teaching of the body of Christ before. Let us, let, let us consider one another to provoke each other unto good works, right? Unto love and good works. This is the purpose of the church, the local New Testament church. It's to benefit one another. This is necessary. Amen. This is a necessity. The, the local New Testament church, there are benefits to it, but it is a necessity. Amen. This is not optional. This is not, you know, just good advice. This is a commandment. Amen. And not only that, let's consider this verse as well where it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, and then it says, as the manner of some is. Who do you think he's speaking about there? There were people at that time that just weren't coming to church, that were just not assembling themselves together. He's speaking about the same people that try to write this verse off. And then it says this, But exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now let me ask you this question. Is the day approaching more now than it was at the time Paul wrote this? Yes. Okay. So what is the admonition? It's even more important, isn't it? Isn't it? To not be forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Amen. Even more today than it was at that point. <clears throat> Turn to Psalm chapter number 133. We're going to end here. Psalm chapter number 133. So we see all the benefits and all <coughs> the ways in which the local New Testament church is necessary to be a full Christian. All the things that were given to the local New Testament church. The gifts, the, the, the keys of the kingdom of, of heaven. Or kingdom of God as it's mentioned in the other gospels. We, can, we see how... It's, it's necessary in order to become a full Christian, to become a full man, to grow into the stature and the measure of Christ. How each other is needed. All of us are needed to come together to provoke each other unto love and good works. And then we have the clear statement, and there's no writing it off, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We see all the times where there are commandments throughout the book of Psalms where you are commanded to praise the Lord in the congregation. Praise the, If you don't, let me say this, if you don't enjoy going to church, your heart is not right. Amen. That's the truth. If you don't enjoy coming to church, there is something wrong with your spirituality and with your Christianity. You need, to, you need to examine yourselves and check out and see what that problem is. And, I, and I'll tell you one of the main reasons that it will be. It's the same reason why Paul, what Paul keeps hitting on over and over again about the importance of church it's because you're selfish. That's why. That's what it comes down to for everyone that doesn't want to go to church, who badmouths the church, who doesn't like church, they don't enjoy church. It's because they're selfish. Because they're thinking, I can do better things with my time. This isn't fun. You're not entertaining me. It's all about them. Me, 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 me. That's all that it's about. This is, this is a fact. You need to enjoy coming to church because it's not only for you, my friend. It's for everybody else here. You are benefiting everybody else here. Amen. Look at Psalm chapter number 133, verse number 1. We'll read the whole chapter. It says this, <clears throat> Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So notice, He commanded the blessing. Do you know what church is? It's a blessing. Amen. That's what church is. Church is a blessing to be able to have a local New Testament church. And let me say this. If your churches are so bad in your area, you know what you need to do? You need to move. Amen. And I don't care if you think that's... I don't care how good your job is. I don't care how anything... I don't give a crap what your... I don't care if your family's, are your, your, family's your next door neighbor. Amen. You need to move. Sorry. Because church is more important. Amen. And you're going to be a half a man your whole life. You're going to be a half a Christian. You're going to be a la You're going to die a lacking Christian that never made it to the measure and the stature of Christ. That's what will happen. You know why? Because you need the body of Christ. Whether you think you do or not, you have to have it. The church, the local New Testament church, is a blessing. 
All the ministries are funneled through the church. All the works are funneled through the church. All the gifts are given to Christians for the church. Christ loves the church. We are commanded to sing praises in the church. We are commanded to praise God in the church, in the congregation. We are commanded to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. If you're not in church, you're in sin. And not only that, you're missing out on a blessing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the local New Testament church. We thank you for founding it upon the rock, dear Lord, and giving us the word of God to base everything upon. We ask you that you'd be with us, dear Heavenly Father, and that you would bless everything that goes on here, that we might uh, be pleasing to you and, and, and do everything that you would uh, want us to do, all the works that you would have us to do, that we would stand up to the model of what you wanted us to be, dear Lord, or at least strive for that, dear God, that we might one day be the perfect man. We ask you that you bless everyone here. We ask you that any gift that someone may have, that they would be able to use it, whether it be in the music uh, uh, ministry or, or out soul winning or, or teaching and preaching in any area that they may have. We ask you that you be with us and help our church here to grow and help us to uh, edify one another and to not be selfish, but to provoke one another unto love and good works. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.